making, making, making contact, making contact. <laughs> This is Making Contact. I'm Anita Johnson. Ever since the first Africans were brought to North America on cargo ships, black women have helped build this country, now known as the United States of America. While black women have played a critical role in the development of our nation, their stories, our stories, have been overlooked and intentionally left out of history books. In the new book, A Black Woman's History of the United States, historians Dr. Dinah Ramey Berry and Dr. Callie Nicole Gross honor the many significant contributions of black women who have worked tirelessly to build this country and fight for social justice in the face of racism and sexism. Today, we'll learn about some of these amazing women. There was no way we could write a book and not feature Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. um, unbought and unbossed. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about her is, is her speech when she does the acceptance speech or when she when she says that she's going to be the, the, the nominee. She's running for president. She makes that announcement and she says, I'm not the candidate for black America, although I'm black. I'm not the candidate for the women, women's America, although I'm, I'm a woman. I'm a candidate. There's another sentence. And then she says, I'm the candidate for the people of America. And it's just a really powerful moment. Um, and it just reminds me of the level of activism when we look at black women last year on the campaign trail. Um, we look at the number of black women that were being considered for the vice presidency. And we have a black and South Asian woman now, uh, Vice President Harris. So that you just think about that. And I think about Shirley Chisholm sort of paving the way for, for these contemporary women. And so we had to include her in here. That's Dr. Dinah Ramey Berry. She, along with Dinah Ramey Berry, joined KPFA's moderator, Sabrina Jacobs, for an insightful conversation about the Black women activists, trailblazers, and others who have left a notable mark on this country. Dr. Kali Nicole Gross. So in thinking about how we, how we're going to do this, right? Well, on one hand, we know that Black women and Black women's experiences, they're not a monolith. Right, and we wanted to make sure that we talked about all kinds of black women, from enslaved women to free women, women in rural parts of the country, women from the South, um, and in urban areas, the North, Midwest, West Coast, you name it, um, all, all walks of life. But in spite of all of their differences, there are a number of themes that seem to impact black women's experiences in broad, broadly. Um, and so we decided that this, this would also be some of the organizing principles for the book. I and mean, you see them here laid out. Travel, motion, and migration is a huge aspect of Black women's experiences, whether that's forced migration, whether uh, Black women chose, elected to leave, but, you know, I say voting with their feet, uh, right? Taking that phase, you know. Um, violence is obviously an inescapable uh, aspect of Black womanhood. We looked at that in a, in a lot of ways, certainly physical violence, sexual violence, but also thinking too about representational violence, the ways that Black women are caricatured um, and ridiculed, also the, the violence of poverty. Um, the, the other theme we worked on was, was certainly activism is a central facet. From, from the first sister who, you know, chose to come, you know, and on an exploration, which Diana will talk more about, um, right up until today, mm -hmm. Black women have been demanding justice, have been decrying inequity, um, and are, are fierce advocates and will stand up and organize. Labor and entrepreneurship are also a vital aspects. And again, we try to approach that broadly, thinking about um, their experiences with respect to enslavement, but also ways that they branched out and tried to cultivate their own careers to escape agricultural labor and domestic service and other kinds of labor that was exploitative even after enslavement. The other big sort of change, not change, but one of the other streams that we really wanted to incorporate is looking at criminalization and incarceration. I think a lot of times when we think about these issues around justice and mass incarceration, we tend to approach this as something that uniquely happens to Black men. And one of the things that we find in history is that Black women were actually more disproportionately overrepresented in the justice system than Black men. 
And that's something that begins um, in the North, almost from the country's founding when they gradually, you know, um, phase out enslavement. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the whole country, including the South once we have the Civil War. So that was a, a key piece to also sort of really tease out too, to see how deeply embedded these biases and misogynoir really is in the country. But at the same time, you know, we didn't want to put together a history that would be sort of this, this one-sided kind of slog through violence and terror and tyranny. We also wanted to capture Black women's vibrancy, that spirit, the passion that keeps folks going. So we also focused on art, performance, creativity. And this is all throughout um, the book, throughout all these different aspects of history. So not just as soon as we get to like 1975, or all of a sudden we're talking about artists or something. No, artists are in the antebellum period. They are in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, you know, creativity, performance, all these things to just sort of highlight the ways that people indulge and express their selves and also a love for their Black womanhood. And then, of course, in thinking about sex and sexuality, we wanted to explore pleasure, right? That we talk a lot about sex and violence and, and terror and these things that happen to Black women. We know a lot about Black women's bodies as victimized bodies, but we also wanted to explore Black womanhood's experience with respect to sexuality and the erotic, and also to with different sexual identities. So we took pains to make sure that we represented the experiences of Black queer women, uh, and again, throughout history. So we don't wait until we get into the 70s to start talking about Black lesbians. We talk about Black queer experiences in the antebellum period, the late 19th century, the 20th century, right up to. So these are sort of the central themes that we structure the, the book around um, and what we sort of took pains to accomplish. And Dinah, Dr. Berry, would you like to go ahead and answer? We've already got a question here. So. Yeah. So we had a question that um, from Lavinia Harrison asking why is family or motherhood not included as a central theme? It's actually not listed as a central theme, but it is, a, it is absolutely um, a theme that is throughout the entire book. And one of the things that we will talk about is all of the mothers that we write about in the book that really did phenomenal, um, phenomenal things under extreme duress and stress. Um, the women that uh, raised children after being the product of rape during slavery, um, the women and mothers like Mamie Till Mobley, who um, had the open casket for her son, Emmett Till, which we'll talk about. And we talk about the mothers of the conjoined twins, um, Millie and Christine McCoy. So mothers are there. We just didn't have it listed as a theme, but there's no way when you read the book that you'll, you'll see that motherhood and family is absolutely a central theme. We just used the ones that uh, Dr. Gross was talking about. That was how we sort of framed, framed the argument. We knew we needed to talk about those we try to talk about each of those in every chapter and motherhood was just naturally there. So hopefully that, that answers your question. I'm, and I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Kelly, or anything. No, I mean, I would agree. I think that is it, in some respects, right. It was sort of naturally there and throughout. Um, and it co comes and occurs through all of the stories and many, many of the, the chapters. And sure. one thing I always say, because my area of expertise is slavery is that you know, not all women, even even in the post-slavery era, even today, not all women choose to be mothers, not all women want to be mothers. And so we have, we always leave a space for that as well. Or some women were forced to be mothers and not really, you know, and having to raise children that they struggled with raising. So there's that, when we talk about motherhood, we have to look at all the complexities of it and some of the challenges there. So I want to jump to um, Isabel de Overa, who opens up the first chapter. And she is a figure who, we did about a year of research on to find out who this woman was. We were trying to figure out where do we start this book? Where do we start in 1619 with the first uh, with the first ship that came that we talk about all the time that now lots of people know about, or do we go a little bit earlier? Are there are there women of African descent that were here earlier? And if so, where were they? What were they doing? What are their stories? Isabel de Overa is one such woman who we were very happy to write about, and other scholars have written about her uh, as well. Um, she was a woman of both African and Indian descent. 
she lived in Mexico and she wanted to go on an expedition um, to travel with a number of other uh, explorers that were going into what now is, it was New Spain, it's called New Spain, but it's present day New Mexico. And she had to file a petition with the local um, government and she had to then have um, witnesses to testify to whom she was and that she was valid um, and, and that they could validate her going. And she was asking and demanding and requesting a piece of paper to show that she was a free woman and that she was bound neither by marriage nor slavery and that she could go on this expedition and that people would not bother her. And she wanted to have this documentation to carry with her as sort of that authentication paperwork so that no one would bother her because she knew that people would be disturbed, as she says, disturbed by her um, being a mulatta. So that was, that's her. And at the end, she says, you know, I'm going on an expedition and have reason to fear that I may be annoyed. I may be annoyed by some individual since I am a mulatta. I demand justice. And as Dr. Gross was saying a few minutes ago, Black women came to this country demanding justice before 1619. And that was really important for us to start with that time period and to start with a woman who was free to show that, that Black people did not just come to this country enslaved that they had lived in freedom and in spaces of freedom in all parts of the world, um, and that their captivity brought them to the United States as enslaved people, um, but not everybody came that way. So that was really important for us to start off with Isabel de Overa. Dr. Dinah Rami Berry. So when we go into the, the next section, this is more familiar. This is really where, uh, if, if you've taken an African-American history class, this is where the textbooks often begin they begin often in 1619. We've been hearing a lot about it over the last year because of the anniversary, um, the, the past anniversary or commemoration of, of the first arrival of 20 odd, the, the quote was 20 odd Negroes. Um, so we looked at, at the women and one woman that was on that particular ship or those ships and that was Angela. And we really went back to understand like, where did she come from? What community did she live in? What was her capture like? What was her experience before she landed? Because most of what we know and most of what we teach is after the landing. But there's such a larger history of women on slave ships. And I want to just read a little section, um, just a quick section about what it might be like to, to be captured from um, the first chapter. Consider for a moment that a, the particular trauma of forced captivity for women. African girls and women might have been tended to children or engaged in other responsibilities in their villages with family and with friends when suddenly someone with a sackcloth on their head put a sackcloth on their heads and chains on their feet. They were violently taken and forced to walk to places that they did not know existed. When they arrived, some of them saw bodies of water that seemed to have no end. Even more frightening was the sight of their captors. This may have been the first time they saw people with white skin. Who were they? Ghosts? Cannibals? evil spirits? Were their captives European or African? How did women make sense of the process of what was happening or did they process what was happening? In the midst of all of this confusion, they were forced to walk in quote unquote slave couples chained by neck or ankles to their captives, other, to other captives, many whom did not speak the same language despite the commonality of their skin tone. Those being transported, they may not have been from the same community. African people came from thousands of different ethnicities and spoke a variety of languages. Barefoot and sometimes naked, they were put into holding facilities with cold concrete floors and walls that did not have windows, a suffocating ventilation system. Bodily fluids such as vomit, blood, urine, and feces caked the floor and the walls and the stench was overwhelming. Speaking sounds of distraught mothers, daughters, aunties, grandmothers, infants, moaning, crying, and screaming were ear-piercing and haunting. This was not a place anyone chose to visit nor cared to remember. It was a place that they all wanted to forget. So that is just a passage of some of the more difficult passages of the book. We actually, if you remember, we um, struggled. Uh, at our, some of our early openings were a little bit too heavy. <laughs> And we had to back up. We, like, we want people to read the book, but there are some pieces in here and there's sections in here that are challenging. If you haven't read about the institution of slavery, if you don't know much about Black women's experience with incarceration, some of those sections are going to be challenging for the reader. But there's also, as Callie was saying, there's joy. There's moments of just great creativity and strength. So it, the whole gamut is in this book. You go to the next, maybe. 
So I'm going to say a few more things and then we'll shift gears. But the, the next section we move into, because we kind of go chronologically. Um, so now we're moving into a period in the third chapter where we're talking about Black women and independence. And the main point of this chapter is to show that Black women were fighting for independence from day one. Um, just as we said with Isabella, Isabel de Overa, um, they filed for petitions and suits. They, they went to court. They ran away. Um, they resisted. They did all kinds of things. So that was that's really the main point. And we've tried to identify how Black women experienced the American Revolution. Dr. Kali Nicole Gross. So the, we moved through the chapters and get to the Civil War, the end of Civil War. We also talked about um, Black women's experiences after the Civil War. I don't know if this passage is too long. No, I think you can go. Chapter six is called Francis's Sex. The Dawning of the Black Woman's Era, 1876 to 1915. And there's a quote that says, none of your damn business. It's Francis Thompson. So in 1876, Francis Thompson, a formerly enslaved Black woman, was arrested in Memphis, Tennessee and fined $50. She had migrated to the area about a decade earlier at a time may be full of hope and excitement as she began her new life as a free woman in the city. She made friends and lived in a booming Black community. She liked nice dresses, especially those in bright colors. In 1866, she would survive the extraordinary violence that decimated her neighborhood. Just a year after emancipation, Frances would testify before a congressional committee, one of five Black women to tell their stories that day. Frances, who relied on crutches because of a foot malady, described how she had been robbed and gang raped by a group of white men, at least two policemen among them. The men burst into the home she shared with another Black woman, Lucy Smith, and savaged them both. As Frances testified, they drew their pistols and said they would shoot us and fire the house if we did not let them have their way with us. The Memphis riots, sparked in part by white rage at Black Union soldiers, claimed over 40 African-American lives, as well as 91 homes, four churches, and 12 schools, the latter all set ablaze. Untold numbers of Black women and girls likely suffered the same fate as had Frances. But Frances and the other women followed in the footsteps of Black women who reported soldiers' crimes during the Civil War. Specifically, they went on record to state unequivocally that they did not consent. And I want to pause here for a minute because I really, really stretch out and thinking about the some of the themes that we talked about and, and the readings that Diana shared also. We, we mark this moment where Black women are really laying claim to themselves and their own bodies for the first time as citizens in the country. And a key aspect of that for Black women was the power to say that they did not consent because up until that point, it was not a crime to rape a Black woman or a Black girl. And that was true for basically either Black or white men. So this was sort of monumental for them to have done that. All right, so I'm just going to finish up. And I promise you, too, it is not much longer. All right, the published congressional report laid bare white cruelties. And locally, Frances Thompson became persona non grata. For the next decade, she would endure police harassment, accused of everything from distributing hoodoo bags and telling fortunes to being responsible for, quote, infamous traffic as a procuress and keeper of one of the vilest dens in the city, end quote. And there were more serious allegations. According to the Memphis Public Ledger, Francis had been, quote, arrested several times on suspicion of being a man and notorious lewdness, but always managed to escape the clutches of the law, end quote. However, in July of 1876, she did not get away. Though Frances maintained that she was, quote, of double sex, a local white doctor, doubtful of her claims, had her arrested, and after subjecting her to a series of invasive examinations by four physicians, they told authorities that her true sex was male. What did these examinations mean for Frances? One wonders how she coped with such violations. Frances had lived at least 20 years as a woman, donning ladies' hats and gingham overskirts with petticoats, 
attire fashionable for her day. The finding that her sex was male forced her into male clothes, men's clothes, and onto a male chain gang. Whereas Frances had maintained a smooth face in custody, authorities denied her the ability to shave. And as the day's doings noted, quote, a thick black beard is coming out all over his face to his great disgust, end quote. As a free woman, Frances had cleaved out a life for herself, weathering seasons that might find her almost in rags or draped in the finest and loud colored toggery. Behind bars, she never suffered her fight, answering rude questions about her gender by responding, quote, none of your damn business. And so these are the kinds of stories and histories. We, when we talked about writing a Black women's history for the 21st century, right. this to me is, is another great example of what that means. Um, and so she is a part of this continuum of Black women and other famous with Mary Church Terrell, certainly also, you know, tremendous figure, on, you know, fighting for suffrage and criminal justice. But we didn't only sort of focus on these folks. We also talked about other kinds of Black women like Augusta Savage, who's another one of my favorite. She was an artist, a sculptress, a Black nationalist. She, um, you know, she founded a free art school in New York because she also wanted to sort of democratize the process. She went abroad on a fellowship and studied in France. Um, you know, her husband was a Garveyite. One of her, her second ex-husband was a Garveyite. Um, but she also was a, a kind of a mover and shaker. You know, she was married and had a child initially very young. You know, then she shed her husband and moved up north and, you know, started referring to, started referring to her daughter as her sister, started lying about her age, saying she was a decade younger and hanging out with these Harlem Renaissance luminaries and on the jazz scene. So, you know, <laughs> she was right. So we talk also about Frances and what art meant to her. Mm -hmm. um, but we also did want to, again, feature the experiences of everyday women. And so we also talk about women who were working as domestics or working as sharecroppers in rural parts of the country, how they managed to sort of fight through, especially during the Depression. Um, and again, always, always, always working to sort of feature Black women's voices whenever we can. And just learned so much too in the process about kind of black women's experiences and also even just sort of the labor of doing that work. I mean, some of the stories are, you know, pretty, pretty sad and harrowing. And so it was also important just to check in and figure out how to kind of mediate that, right? Tell those stories and and come back from it. Um, but again, we try to talk about all types of women, so even women who desegregate the armed forces, who are among the first to serve. And we also definitely, this is back to sort of the question, I think, where someone had raised about mothers. We talk a lot about Black women's experiences um, in the community, um, in their own way, but also as freedom fighters. And we spend a lot of time talking about women like Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mother, because everyone knows about Emmett Till, but we don't really talk about, you know, Mamie, if she hadn't made this courageous decision, um, you know, to, to open up this coffin, um, we would not know his story. He wouldn't have been that spark, right, that sort of set the, you know, the civil rights movement kind of ablaze. And the thing is that when we study her and talk about her, we realize it was so much more than just making a decision to open that coffin, it was fighting to even reclaim his body from the, you know, officials in the South because they were intent upon trying to cover it up and bury it. You know, she had to do all of this networking and, you know, mobilizing local officials in Chicago. So you think about when we see these instances of young people murdered violently by racists and how the mothers, the families hardly get a moment to grieve right, before they have to go to battle to try to get justice. She's one of these very, very early examples of that. So we spend a lot of time talking about Mamie and quoting her and using her words 
as much as possible. We also quote the parents of the four little girls who died in the church bombing in 1963 in Birmingham. Um, their mothers also talking about the justice, the pain, the sorrow of that loss. A virtual question was presented to Dr. Kali Nicole Gross and Dr. Diana Ramney Berry. The question, Black women's suffrage and negotiating racism of the white women's movement, was that covered in the book? I mean, we definitely talk about the ways that Black women tried to organize with white women's suffragists, <laughs> the racism that they encounter. But also, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I love about that, our history, is that, you know, Black women aren't daunted by these things, right? You know, they know that that, that bias is there and that these alliances are shaky, that white supremacy ultimately, you know, is going to be a, a dividing issue for them. So they continue to network and organize their own organizations and clubs. Black women organize voter, you know, voter registration drives. They, you know, collected testimonies and worked with politicians to try to change legislation when it was clear that Black people, once they did get the right to vote, um, were having their, their votes, you know, being denied. Um, they fundraise for uh, various candidates, took them around to churches. I mean, you name it. So exactly. Black women have championed the right to vote, you know, going as far back as we can remember. But I mean, one of the earliest proponents that most people know is certainly Sojourner Truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Along with like Frederick Douglass. I mean, you know, okay. <laughs> Black women right. have always championed, you know, for these rights and issues. So the thing, I, I guess I just want to point out too, is some of it also for us was about not wanting to just have a history that's about sort of being in reference to what white folks or white women are doing also the Thank other you. piece right that we want to center black women's voices and activism it doesn't mean that we don't talk about you know their encounters with white racists and also you know on those rare instances when they were able to work as allies but at the end of the day we were focusing on black women in the narrative Absolutely. Dr. Barry, you want to add anything? No, I, I think she said everything. I mean, there's an example that you probably have recently seen because of the suffrage movement. I mean, the 19th Amendment anniversary that just passed again. Yes. So we, you know, you heard about Ida B. Wells being told mm -hmm. that she had to, she had to march in a segregated section of, of a suffrage parade. And she went right up in there with the other women and had their signs and went right to the front. So black women don't always respond to the segregation or the disrespect mm. or the marginalization that we're being put in a place in. And okay. so I would just say that that's an example of uh, a black woman saying, no, I'm not marching in the back of this parade. And mm -hmm. we have come forward because we've been working on this in the trenches just as long as you have. So I, that's what I would say is that, that we were there. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. not just a book about we were there. It's also about how we were there and what we did when we were there. You've been listening to A Black Woman's History of the United States on Making Contact. Thanks to the authors, Donna Rami Berry and Callie Nicole Gross. And thank you to KPFA for granting us use of this audio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please write and review us twice on Apple Podcasts. And then please share it with your friends and family via Facebook and on Instagram. We're Making Contact Project. To learn more about us and access other episodes for free, visit radioproject.org. I'm Anita Johnson. Thank you so much for listening to Making Contact. <laughs>